Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of The Pulse with BP. I'm your host, Billy Parvatam. I'm pleased to be joined today by a guy who's a townie from Washington, D.C. <laughs> he's done WTOP. He's done the Wizards. He's done the Mystics. He's been all over the D.C. broadcast network. It's Mr. Frank Hanrahan. Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, man. How are you? Pretty good. So I wanted to start off with, you know, you mentioned uh, when before we got on this recording that you are a uh, native of the D.C. area. But what made you want to get interested in broadcasting? Ooh, that's that's a good question. Uh, so simple yet so um, so many layers to the answer. No, uh, when I was when I was a younger kid, uh, I, I mean I was really into sports, and I thought when I was younger I would play. You know, like a lot of us <laughs> would be a professional player at some point. But then I realized that that wasn't going to happen, and for some odd reason I was always enamored with the game, but then also the broadcasters. So I remember, I mean, this is amazing how the shelf life of guys that you grew up with are still working like Marv Albert. You know, I remember I was a young kid, very, maybe six or seven, I was imitating him. And I remember him doing boxing and basketball and uh, and even like Howard Cosell uh, was another big name back in the days. So it was just like, okay, I really like the whole spectacle of it right not just the game but you know the Brent Musburgers doing NFL today and Dick Enbergs and and stuff like that so I I figured out if playing isn't gonna happen for me I I would like to be a broadcaster so that's pretty much the the root of it and um, you know as my wife always says it's pretty cool that you get to do something you've always wanted to do but I, I give her a little asterisk. I say, well, I always wanted to be a professional NBA player. <laughs> that would have been nice. But then being a broadcaster was okay as a second uh, option. So you went to uh, Ithaca College in uh, upstate New York. What opportunities did you get there to start developing your broadcasting skills? Yeah, so that was a great uh, setup because you're in a, a small uh, school environment. So you don't necessarily have the CBS's of the world or the NBC's or the ESPN's doing your game. So it was a student run uh, station and TV and radio. So you got a lot of hands on stuff really fast, which was pretty cool. Not saying that doesn't exist at bigger schools, but like, like that was the only option for people to watch or to listen was through the student run um, stations. So it was really cool that we had that, um, you know, firsthand um, opportunities. And there were like, like a lot of guys that I went to college with who, you know, have really done well for themselves. Uh, like David Muir, the ABC uh, main news guy was my class. Uh, Kevin Connors, who does some stuff at ESPN was, was there when I was there. So there are a lot of good success stories. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that we were just thrown right into it and said, you got to figure it out yourself. So I, I didn't know that you went to school with David Muir. How was that like to go to school with him? Did you know he had the talent even then? I, you know what, it's, um, he was like, at the time you were like, wow, this guy is really, he's really eager, <laughs> but it paid off because when I was, you know, we're, we're, we're freshmen and sophomores. And I remember somebody telling me, or no, because we would get like the Syracuse stations because we were in Ithaca, which is about an hour from Syracuse. And I remember one weekend and I, I'm not kidding. I was a sophomore. I look up and I look at the local news in Syracuse and it's David doing the news. I was like, Oh my God, you know, we're, we're just trying to have fun, you know, on campus or find the next party. And this guy is out doing local news already in, in college. So yeah, it was pretty obvious then too. Yep. So how did you, you know, track your journey from, you know, you, cause you grew up in DC, you went to upstate New York for college. And how did you find your way back to the DC area doing what you do now? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was a, I was a decent high school athlete. And so I wanted to do, you know, sports in college. Um, So I actually decided to go up there to play sports and do, and they had a really good um, broadcasting school. So that was like the lure of going up to upstate New York. But I always tell my kids now, like go somewhere warm because here in Blacksburg, I'd go somewhere warm. You'll you'll realize it in 10 years, like, what was I doing? It was so cold (laughs) there. But uh so in fact, like, you know, I was, you know, quite frankly, I was not the most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I wasn't the, the best at like networking in college. And, and you know, you don't think it's ever going to happen that you're going to graduate and actually go into the real world. 
So when I was like a senior, I think I was like, oh man, I got to figure out what I'm going to do. Even though I knew I wanted to do sports broadcasting and stuff. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to go to, you know, back to DC and, and start up right away. Um, so just through like family and networking a little bit, I randomly like accepted and took a job down in Florida, like, uh, uh, North of Tampa, Florida, small town doing like high school sports and, uh, doing like, uh, morning, uh, radio. So that was the one thing that I realized early. And I would tell young aspiring broadcasters, like get as much hands-on doesn't matter what it is. Could be early morning radio, doing high school games, whatever you got to do, just get your foot in the door. So that's how I sort of just went all the way, you know, from upstate New York. I started off in 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 uh, Central Florida back in the in the mid '90s. But I always had like that itch, like you know, at some point I want to go to a, a major market and and do some work there. So like in 1998. I came back like just on a whim. I was like, I just want to go home and, and try my hand there and, and see what I can do. And so I just moved back to my parents and would start sending out tapes and stuff. And local, luckily, it was crazy. I, I got uh, a connection with a guy who did some stuff with WTOP and they liked my tape. And I went in and started doing some part time stuff and uh, and that led to full time stuff. So you know, again, just getting my foot in the door and then being available and doing whatever I had to do to uh, to help the cause. And they recognize that. So that was that was pretty much the journey from college to to getting back to D.C. So what's your daily routine like at WTOP? Because I think the other thing that's interesting about you is that you haven't just done play by play. You've done editing. I mean, you edit your own stuff. You done. Yeah. Videos. I mean, you really are well branded in terms of what you've been able to do. Well, thank you. Uh, but that, you know, that's the thing that you also learn, too. It's like when I took a job uh, six years ago at, at, at WSA, I was hired like strictly to be a sports anchor, right? Where literally I was not allowed because of union rules. Like you can't edit or you can't touch that. But of course, over that time and knowing where we are now, it was understood, no, we have to learn. We have to grow. We have to understand different technologies and how to edit how to produce, how to write, how to shoot. Like by the end, I was, you know, you're doing one man standups, which is almost like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was like, that was mind blowing. Like, wow, they're doing this one man band thing. <laughs> now it's sort of pretty much standard. So to your point and your question, for me to grow, I knew it sort of clicks like, all right, dude, you got to put your ego aside. You got to figure out all these different ways to help yourself. And that is certainly something that you need to recognize. I need to have all of this covered, not just three things. I need to have the whole gamut. So, um, yeah, so that's something that I've definitely acquired in the last five, 10 years, being able to do a lot more things than I usually was able or accustomed to doing. I want to go specifically to your time as a play by play announcer. You, you know, you've been the, the voice of the, the Washington Mystics. Uh, what's it like to prep every day for a game? I mean, you know, you've got all these games. How do you find a way to keep prepping, find interesting stories and be able to relate that on your broadcast? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think a lot of it does come down to, and I wish I had known this maybe a little bit earlier when I was starting out um, in terms of just building relationships with players and coaches. I, I definitely got better at that as I got older and, you know, new regimes would come in um, and you could really, establish a good report with them. Um, but I would say that that's one of the key things. Like to me, quite frankly, I'm not the biggest stats guy or analytics guy. I think that when you're doing a broadcast, you know, rarely are you listening for, who cares if somebody's a 78% free throw shooter, unless it's like the last free throw of the game, like, okay. Or during that game, how has that person shot free throws? Um, so I think also it's just, you know, like I said, at the, at the start, for me personally, I always like the whole spectacle of the game and the announcer adds more to that flavor. And I think in terms of getting that relationship with the player, with the coach, uh, understanding what they're trying to do, you know, we'd always have conference calls with the coach and, and stuff like that, but that was more like you know, just I'm doing a job interview, but you got a chance before games to talk with players and stuff like that when they might give you a little bit more 
Um, so to answer your question in terms of like preparation, yeah, obviously you want to know everybody and who's playing and all that stuff. But I think it's more for me, it was more the human element um, and not not necessarily the numbers, if that makes sense. So how does that differ that prep? You know, when because you were also at one point the the studio host for the Wizards pregame and postgame. How does that differ? I mean, because now you're you know setting the stage before the game and then talking after the game. And how does that work when you're the studio host? Yeah, the studio host thing was great. And it's almost like, because again, it's almost like you hearken back. For me, it's it's what to, maybe this is a, maybe not the best idea, but to me, it's like, what am I looking for, right? When I, when I turn on a game, I want to be excited. I want to get the anticipation up uh, for that game. Uh, you know, insights, what do we expect? Uh, so certainly it's different in terms of what you're giving the audience, uh, you know, the buildup. And then the play-by-play -play person does does what you're building it up. And then the post game, you know, you just react. So it's more of like trying to trigger people's emotions uh, more with the pre and post game show. But yeah, th those were fun. And I, I sort of missed that. And this is a very interesting time now with, with what we're going through, like the, the effect that that has had on broadcasting, because now it's like, you know, you see people like in their basement doing the games and it's just doesn't it to, for me, it doesn't connect. And as much as we talk about the future of broadcasting, because I remember three or four years ago, literally before the pandemic, people were talking about, Oh, you know, in the future we'll have people will do the games from not from the location. But I think that we've realized with this, the silver lining in all of this is no, no, we need people there or we need people in a studio because it just, as a viewer, it just doesn't doesn't pop with me when you have people calling games from literally from their basement. It just doesn't. To me, it doesn't translate. For sure. And like I mentioned, you, you worked for the Wizards at one point. I'm sure you still have connections to the team. I really love the fact that we're able to do this today because we just got the news yesterday that Russell Westbrook and John Wall essentially a swap and a first round pick trade to each other. So now Westbrook comes to D.C. along with Bradley Beal. What do you think that does for the Wizards? What do you, what do you think their outlook is going into the season? Quite honestly, I think it gives them a much better chance of being successful. Um, I've always, from afar, I've always admired Westbrook, not necessarily the way that he is in terms, again, back to the stats. His stats aren't that great, but, you know, I've always just admired his, his tenacity and his uh, aggressiveness. And I think that does rub off, especially on a younger team, uh, because he was it two or three years ago, he averaged a triple double, averaged a triple double. It's like that just went over our heads like, yeah, OK, he averaged a triple double. And I thought, you know, Wall was fine. I, I he had his moments. I was never a big like, oh, I think John Wall is so great. I mean, he's a very good player, um, you know, but I'm not I'm not heartbroken. <laughs> I think it's good for the franchise. Uh, clearly they needed to go in a different direction. And he obviously wanted to go in a different direction. So, you know, what would really the, the nuts and bolts of it all is if you think about it, and this is what boggles my mind about anything related to pro sports is this franchise paid John Wall probably nearly $200 million, right? $200 million uh, in, in 10 years or so. And he's unhappy. <laughs> what? Seriously? So good. I mean, if you don't want anybody, if, if somebody doesn't want to be here after they've been paid $200 million, that's fine. I mean, I wish him luck. But I like Russell Westbrook. I think actually may be a decent fit. For sure. And as the Mystics announcer, you got to travel all over the WNBA. Did you have a favorite place you'd like to go to, whether it was the arena, whether it was the city that you enjoyed visiting? Yeah, let's see. Um, Seattle was cool just because it was, you know, it was different. I don't think I had, may have been there once or twice before, but it was like a quick in and out. So Seattle was cool to visit. Uh, Sacramento was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> sort of like a it was a farm town like it wasn't I was like I can't believe an NBA team is here a WNBA team is here it's like just sort of sprawling uh who else I'm trying to think I think yeah, Seattle was probably the best place to do, was place to, to visit yeah for sure yeah it was cool and as a you know guy who's called WNBA games what can the league do to I think increase popularity get more fans to watch in the game I mean is there anything they can do or is it kind of a standard that they're oh, that's a good question i mean i always for years i always said they need to get rid of that ball i thought the ball is a dumb idea just why have multicolored make it normal why do we have to have a like a crazy ball like i didn't like that idea um i think the officiating needs to be better i think they need to loosen up um because i think 
I, I, you know, and I hate replay. I think they need to get rid of replay. Like just, it doesn't, all these leagues are trying to be the same. Like I, I, I don't understand why everybody has to be the same or, you know, because as a fan, when I turn, like I literally will turn on a WNBA game and they'll be reviewing a play. Uh, and I just don't like that with the NBA either. It's like, I, I get, we're trying to get things right, but then why, why even have humans out there? Like it's part of the whole process is to have failure and disappointment. And um, so I get rid of replay. I get rid of the ball. Um, I may like even, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe shorten the shot clock even further. Maybe put it like at 20 seconds. Um, I do like the smaller arenas that they're doing. Like that's a good thing. Um, I saw their ratings were really up for during their time in the bubble. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think those would be like my little tweaks for now. I could probably give you a whole dossier if you gave me a couple of weeks. Cause I saw, you know, I saw so many games where there would be some really fantastic games and it's just like the men's game too. And then there'd just be some duds where you're like, Oh my God, like, the consistency of it was, was just not good. And, it's, and the officiating too, like there's just, so I would like them to loosen up a little bit and be more free flowing and uh, celebrate the game a little bit more because I think like, you know, I've watched a lot of basketball, man, over the years and it's just getting so, you know, cause I'm almost, I'm 47. So it's like the game that I grew up on, it's just like athleticism now is way too much, over actually playing the game does that make sense yeah for sure and like we're trying to perfect something that's not so i'd advise all these leagues to just loosen up a little bit more get rid of these final two minute reports or whatever just let's let's play the game and have some fun there you go that that would be my my little headline for a play <laughs> for sure have some fun for, for crying out loud for sure and as a as a dc native i was interested to hear your take on this because you know all your life you either grown up you know, watching, you know, the sports teams around here or covering the sports teams in some form or capacity. Where does D.C. rank as a sports town? I mean, as you know, when you think of D.C., you automatically think of politics and the nation's capital. But, you know, we've seen some success here recently with the Nationals and the Capitals. And, you know, the football team has a passionate fan base, regardless of their record in recent history. But where do you think D.C. ranks as a sports town? Uh, It's, you know, it's in the middle. It's not it's not fantastic. It's not. I would say in, in everything, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting because, you know, you get that word transient thrown out uh, a lot. A lot of folks that live here now are not from here. So they're going to games rooting for their, their team. So that was always um, interesting when I would go to the Wizards games and literally like the Knicks, even when they stunk, would be in town and half the arena would be New York fans or Celtic fans. Like, where are these Celtics fans from? And then you got the bandwagoners, like Golden State all of a sudden has all these fans <laughs> and the Lakers of all these fans. But that's part of the issue with these local teams when you're not winning for so many years. Why would you have people get on that bandwagon? Now, I'm one of those rare cats. I don't know about you, but I was just, I just assumed because I'm from here, I have to root for the team. So I like sort of took that from when I was a young kid and I would just always root for the, the home team. But when you have squads like the bullets and wizards who don't win for so many years, Washington football doesn't work for, win for so many years. Um, it's just hard to create a really solid fan base. So the fans were there, they're here, they're here for sure. It's just, can that team provide them with the reason to cheer for them? So that's where I stand on that. I would say, you know, it's almost like the old field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Like if you're not putting together a good product, uh, you're not going to get people to come out, but they're there for sure. Absolutely. People know they just need to be attracted to it more. Speaking of a team like the Wizards, you know, how do they win? I think in today's NBA, because you look at it, you know, every year for the NBA championship, there's really four or five teams you think have a legit shot to win. And then everyone else is playing catch up. So how does a team like the Wizards who are not in a small market? I mean, you're in the nation's capital. How do they either attract free agents or, you know, uh, co-sign big trades or how do they build from the ground up to really be able to realistically compete for a championship? Yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, you can really turn things around quick. Like I'm sort of from that uh, idea of, you know, Golden State used to suck. It sucked. They were terrible. And then all of a sudden they get two, three dudes who, who just know how to play and kind of can change the game. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, why, why can't we be like Golden State? And you just remember when they were not very good. 
So it really doesn't take all that much, quite frankly, to turn a franchise around. And that's where I'm always like critical of, of individuals that, uh, you know, specifically now where you can, the NBA, you can get two or three guys and turn things around. I'm not saying that's going to happen for the Wizards right now, but, you know, you look at the Wizards roster and you go, you know what, they're not, they're not that bad. Uh, when you compare it to other teams in the league and you say, why aren't they doing better? Now, last year was an asterisk year. John Wall's been hurt for a couple of years. But yeah, quite frankly, if Wall was healthy the last couple of years, they probably are, are a three or four seed in the East because the East just wasn't that good. Um, so my advice to, you know, to the Wizards and guys like Scotty Brooks is, um, and I, I don't believe in tanking. Like, who, I mean, this NBA draft, I couldn't tell you three guys <laughs> like that could could make a change. Um, so that, that's why Bradley Beal, I, I, I always hold him to a higher standard. Like, yeah, great. You average 30 points a game, but you know, you can, you can do more to pick up your team. Um, that's my only criticism of him where he's very, and he's very hot and cold in terms of his leadership, I think. But to answer your question, I, I, I truly think that, you know, if they, you know, who, who knows about this draft pick? I have no idea. But let's say he's this, this three-point marksman. You got this Bertans guy who comes out of nowhere and actually has a really good year. So it's like, you know, hitting a couple cylinders, you start building pieces and that confidence settles in. And then you start, you start seeing the success. Uh, so we shall see about these draft picks because right now, obviously that's the way to go to, to build these draft picks is not through free agency. We know they're not coming here unless you're making a trade with two guys with huge contracts that people are trying to get rid of. But, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. But I, I'm one of those thing believers who can say, you know, two to three years, things can change around rather quickly in this league. As someone who's followed DC sports all your life, who would you say is the best DC sports athlete you've seen, or is there a Mount Rushmore you'd say of like four guys these Ooh. are the best four we've seen. Hmm. That's a good any, question. Any sport, all the teams. Yeah, yeah, play. yeah. Uh, for me, like, um, wow. That, that's a good one. Um, hmm. Like who? Yeah. Man, I may have to come back to you on that. That's a tough one. In terms of like, you know, in, in the early 90s, um, you know, for me, you know, a guy like Riggins was awesome, uh, you know, helping the Washington football team win that Super Bowl. He was fantastic. And he had a good four or five years of just, you know, dominating. Um, you know, I was always a, was a mark for Elvin Hayes when back in the late 70s, um, even though I had an interesting, that's a thing too, man, when you, you know, you admire these, these athletes and then you kind of come across them and you're like, eh. It wasn't the nicest person to me, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's see. That's two. Um, hmm. May have to. I mean, Arenas was fantastic, but I just can't do it because he was because of his his issues. Like that. That's astounding to me what he did. So I can't put him up there. Um, you know, Beal's getting close. Beal's getting close. Wall's getting close. I think it's almost with Wall, you got to like wait a few years and look back. Cause like, that's the thing with him. I, I know that he was impactful. I know he was good, but like he didn't, he wasn't like, oh, I gotta, I gotta turn on the game to watch John Wall. It never got to that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, uh, see, I, if I, if I can give you four uh, of, yeah. again, if I'm just comparing all the teams, I'd go at least yeah. today's age, I don't have the perspective you have, but I'd go Zimmerman, uh, Ovechkin, Backstrom, and I'd throw Max Scherzer in there. Yeah, my bad. I totally forgot about Ovechkin. Yeah, Scherzer's a beast too. Yeah, I like Scherzer. He was, yeah, he's one of those guys where, yeah, he's just intense all the time. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. He may be, he may be up there when all is said and done, like in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, Ovechkin and, and at least a national. Yeah, Zimmerman. Yeah, I like Zimmerman. Funny story about Zimmerman. I I was doing some uh, side hustle like coaching tennis, and like <laughs> I just saw him like chilling with his like walking down the street. I was like, oh. There's Ryan Zimmerman. <laughs> nice. Daddy, you know, I didn't say anything. Like, hey, congrats on the World Series one. But, yeah, no, that's, that's a good list. Yeah, Ovechkin, Zimmerman, or, uh, yeah, or, or Scherzer for sure. Best, uh, how about, do you have a memorable interaction you've had with, I know you mentioned Zimmerman, but has there been a memorable action with covering one of these players you think, man, that was really awesome to look back on? 
there was a coach that I really liked, even though like fans didn't. North Turner was like really nice. He was a really fantastic dude. And like the, the broadcasting business has changed so much. We're now it's just Zoom stuff. But back in the days when I first started out, I was sort of like wide eyed and didn't know any better, which sometimes can be really beneficial where you just you don't know the rules. So you just whatever. Hey, coach. So I remember I, I, I was sent out really late, like, hey, can you go cover this? coach's press conference and I got there way late and um and I remember North Turner literally was like oh did you not get here on time do you have do you want do you need to talk to me like what can you imagine that today like an NFL coach going this is the head coach going hey wait uh, you, you you missed it you need to you need to talk with me and so he took the time and we talked for 10 minutes like a one-on-one totally bizarre like okay and I really appreciated that. And then he was like super nice about everything afterwards. That's probably why I wasn't that successful because he was, he was just way too nice. Like he would offer me food, like, Oh, you can want lunch, whatever. Um, and then, and I remember like Daryl green was still playing and I would, again, I was just this young wide eyed kid and I'd walk out and be like, Hey Daryl, you got a second, not knowing any rules or whatever. Like, ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So it's like the, the moral of the story is, doesn't hurt to ask. Now there have been other times where I think I did like a tur- golf tournament. Yeah, the the whatever it is around here, whatever it was called. And whoever was leading after the third round, I forget his name. He didn't win it, but he was leading after the third round. And the news director was like, or the sports director was like, hey, try to get the guy for a one-on-one. He was local. And he was leading the tournament after three rounds. And I think he did like his one, he did his media availability in the tent and was walking out. And I said, went up to him again. I knew the rules then. And I said, Hey, you know, blah, 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 blah. blah. You got, you got two, three minutes. So we can do a quick one-on-one with you about your, your, your third round. He said, no, <laughs> like, what? Like I thought he would just be like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And I don't know why he said no. I guess he had other things to do or go focus on the next day. But um, so rarely do you get a no. So you remember the no's. You remember like, oh, dude, really? Come on, man. Um, who else? Uh, yeah, there's some times where you're just like, yeah, just be gracious and nice to people. Like, I, I, I'm not going to name names, but there's so many times where I'm going into an arena. Like, I'll do a Mystics game and I'll be walking down the hall and there's a a wizard or something. And I'll be like, Hey, what's up, man? How are you? Like blank stare. I'm like, bro, come on. I'm not trying to get anything out of you. I'm literally just saying hello. It could have been anybody, but it just happened to be you. <laughs> so that sticks with you, right? Like you'd remember if somebody like sort of just, you know, is this guy, like just say hello. It's okay. doesn't matter who you are. Sure. And we've already talked about the Wizards and let's talk about the football team. What do you think they need to do to kind of get back on track? Because, I mean, they've got a fat, passionate fan base. I mean, they play in a, probably the worst division in football. It doesn't take much to win the division. What do they need to do to really get back on track and make it back to the Super Bowl for the first time since the 90s? Well, whatever they're doing right now is working. So <laughs> keep doing that. And Alex Smith, as much as I thought this was never going to happen, he, uh, He's been fantastic. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy that position where you literally need somebody who knows what they're doing at a very high level. Like uh, you saw the disaster with RG three and you just saw the disaster with the Broncos. Like you just, it is such a specific skill set that you need to have in that spot. And they, for now they've got a great caretaker in Alex Smith. And I think this is going to actually really, really help them moving forward. Now their schedule is a, is a, is a bear. It could maybe win one, two, maybe at best three of these games, but they only have to probably win two to win the division. If you look at the other teams in the division, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and I was, I was skeptical of Rivera at the start too, uh, the way that he handled a couple of the losses, but, but clearly he knows what he's doing. So I'm going to get behind that. So right now their formula is working pretty well. They got some really nice young pieces. Can they build on that? remains to be seen but they've got a nice building block that's for sure my final question for you frank you've been so gracious with your time what's your advice to aspiring sports broadcasters who want to get reps during this pandemic obviously we've never been in this situation before so it's a unique and first time for all of us what's your advice to the up-and-coming broadcasters who want to get in the business but have to deal with the realities of this pandemic yeah that's a great question uh 
when I was younger, certainly I would, uh, you know, watch games and practice that way. Um, old games, new games, still are still playing. So you can watch some games and, and get reps in that way. You guys have so much more technology now than I did in terms of doing stuff like this or working on your on camera stuff or editing, um, you know, on your, on your laptop, which, uh, we did not have. <laughs> so I think that's, that's part of the deal. Like just getting a lot of practice in editing, making connections. Uh, there's so many great ways to, to connect with people. And I think that would be, you know, my number one piece of advice is, you know, keep getting the reps in, make connections, um, have a, have a good, um, good demo, good uh, website or wherever we can find a good link to some of your work, stuff like that. Um, Cause it's a, it's as, as great as there are options out there in terms of so many different ways to do it. Um, there is still a lot of um, uh, competition as well, but I think what, what will separate those from the others is just what I kind of said, where, you know, just be ready, like always be ready to and always have your stuff ready for people to look at. So that would be my advice. Frank, thank you so much for your time. Can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me. Oh, anytime, man. I appreciate it, dude. That's Frank Hanrahan, WTOP, Washington Wizards, Washington Mystics, a DC lifer. Thank you so much to him for joining us. We'll see you next time on The Pulse with BP.